Previously on Save Like a Bear, this teeny tiny exploration seemed to motivate many of you story lovers. You do not want to wet yourself in that suit. Why would you need to make a purchase decision about a Spider-Man costume? Because we like to live vicariously. Following the career of someone like Tom Holland before and after the Spider-Man 3 release, has all the benefits of following a character like Peter Parker. I've talked previously about how our parasocial relationships mean the other person can't get angry at you for being a bad friend. Just like experiencing Holly's travel photos means you get to say, oh, Nairobi, that seems nice, I'm glad you had a good time, or oh, I wish I could have done that. With none of the downsides, such as your family fearing you'll be kidnapped because you're a VIP and you tweeted your location. We all struggle with comparison syndrome, and I'm guessing you're here because like me, you're fascinated with how the other half lives. Our favourite superhero stories though are about who we are without money and connections. Strongest version of yourself, here's yourself. So what are we missing, supposedly? I'll share the mindset shifts and discoveries that have made it harder for me to envy the rich and famous. If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. Or perhaps you're just here because you wanted more from Tom Holland, aka Peter Parker. Underoos keeps skate crashing the party, we're having I try telling King Holly to leave, but it's no use. I don't want to go. Also, the kings around here seem to be multiplying. You are who you hang with, I guess. Let's examine anyway how to fracking achieve the exceptional when you don't think you're exceptional, all via lessons from our favourite entertainers who've touched the burning flagpole first. Welcome back subscribers to this whirly gig of fun research and experiments. P.S. I'm not a financial advisor. Don't forget you can speed me up in the settings because I want you to save time and money because time travel is impossible. How has that altered sort of the course of your life since it's all happened? Are you feeling the effects of it yet? It's been pretty crazy. I've been so sort of focused on work and focused on promoting the movie that I haven't really had a chance to look at my life from like an outside point of view. I imagine you just work in a bubble. Yeah, you just live in this little bubble and it just so happens that that bubble is a Spider-Man movie and now I've sort of stepped back out of the bubble. I'm like, oh, f <laughs> The movie's coming out! <laughs> Hang on, a Coco. are you having a giraffe? We just time travel back to 2017. And King Holly's interview with the Nerdist podcast. Right here, people. This is where magic happens. I won't speculate too much on the gap between Holly's financial before and after because that's his business. However, his dad, Dominic Holland, is a prolific content creator and his podcast occasionally puts Holly's trajectory in perspective. Like while Dom spontaneously bought a plane ticket 10 years ago to visit his son abroad filming on location because we find ways to afford our true priorities, he also wouldn't splash that regularly because that's the occupational hazard of self-employment. These days I'd argue having no travel money is an occupational hazard of being employed, especially if you've ever been furloughed, and that self-employment instead has unlimited earnings potential, but that's a debate for another day. Also Dominic tells a story about having to leave Armani because the bill at a fitting got past 8,000, and then the production clarified that Holly's suit budget for the premiere for The Impossible was $200. Oops, I know what you're thinking, how could this possibly help you because you don't have a time machine or any of Holly's performing or athletic ability. You don't even own a cute dog to game some Instagram followers with because pets expect food and expensive shiz like veterinary care. Sandra, just because this is never going to work, there's no need to be negative. Overnight success is a myth. Is it? I don't know. That's what everyone's saying. Oh. It's easy to forget that for someone like Holly to be talking about Cherry and Chaos Walking and Spider-Man No Way Home and Uncharted. They've usually been auditioning for over 10 years, or if they're Ed Sheeran, they've been playing instruments and songwriting since they were at school. You don't want to compare yourself financially to Holly in the present. You also don't need to use someone else's past as a benchmark, because it doesn't matter what their parents could afford before they put that work in. I recommend only comparing yourself to yourself. Obviously in 2020 some of us felt like we had put in our 10,000 hours only to hit a brick wall. You can develop skills at any age though. Sherry Salata was an executive producer for Oprah but she didn't enter working television until age 35 and then became an author and started an online business in her 50s. It's never too late to do anything. We should probably also approach everything with the expectation that we need to enjoy the process somehow because we might not peak until the next decade. If that doesn't reassure you, bear with me, no pun intended. I knew that they were going to make a new Spider-Man and Tom, because he was, uh, had been long-listed for an Oscar, he was very well known in Hollywood and he's a brilliant gymnast and he's a good-looking kid. So I thought, well, it wouldn't surprise me if he was in the running. And when the agents in America said, you've got to start taking for Spider-Man, I, I just never in a million years imagined that it would ever come through. I just thought that, even though, even though Tom had had this gilded career already, mm. I just thought that kind of break happens yeah. to other families. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't happen to me, because I was, uh, you know, most of the actors coming out of Britain now are all at Eton and Harrow, and Tom went to a comprehensive school, he's just, I'm an ordinary guy, I think he's going to a posh school, so I just thought these things don't happen to my family. And I actually handled it. 
remarkably well, you know, because he's, he's been incremental, because he's made about eight films, so it's not like he's yeah. just become a movie star. Yeah. So he's been able to adjust. I mean, are you involved in his management? No, not no, at all. No, no. no. So that was a conscious decision, because I think that's going to compromise our family. Yeah. I'm his dad, right? Yeah. I'm always going to be his dad. He can't sack his dad, he can't sack his manager. Yeah. And I just think it's eggy. I, I just think it's much better to delineate Tom's career and then Tom's family life. Hmm. But you can still give him advice. I, and I can still tell him off, and I'm still one of the people who say, hey, Tommy, being a, you're being a, that's, yeah. that's, bad, that's bad, you're not being very sensible there. His agents are worried about being sacked, whereas I'm not. He can't sack his old man. You did do Billy Elliot when you were what? Ooh, 12, 11 through 13. So then it happened. Adoration is everywhere. You're on the West End yes. playing Billy Elliot the musical, and you're saying, I'm a star. Well, well no. <laughs> no. I would never well, say that. that's what Maggie had said to me. That's what my dad that's said. It. Whenever my dad tells me off, he goes, he's like, he calls me movie star, mm -hmm. and it bugs me so much. It makes me so angry. But he's like, hey, movie star. <laughs> But we're kind of managing now because he's gone bananas because he gets free stuff. They give him stuff. They give him a car. <laughs> you know, they just give him stuff. And he says, would you like an Audi R8? No, uh, not really. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So we, we sort of pair that back and we say, Tommy, you want to work up to that? What's wrong? No one wants to give you a free car? Suppose you want Dominic Holland to be a surrogate dad as well, eh? You know what this is? It's another case of can open. All Spain everywhere, like a can of worms, only more toxic. And instead of all Spain, the mistake here is that when we compare our lives to others, we neglect how they got there and how long it took. But we also spray assumptions everywhere about their spending. Paying agents, managers, business expenses, taxes can whittle six or seven figures very quickly. Or a £50,000 advance on a book, for instance, could leave a novelist on 10 grand a year after tax. Can you imagine? Flying under a helicopter and being dunked in the lake. I mean, I don't get paid enough for that. If you're me, that's fine. I've lived on 10k a year in the past in London, not accounting for inflation, of course. For the majority of us that has responsibilities, like a cute dog or kids that you can't take back to the shop or a loan or a car, I used to walk to work, then 10 grand a year doesn't go very far, especially if you like extravagances like central heating or not collecting all your food for free from Olio or watching the Avengers at the cinema instead of waiting two years to borrow a DVD because you couldn't afford a TV license for the TV premiere either. Would anyone have known that by looking at me or known that after a point I chose to live that way so that my savings could compound interest and I could buy a house? No. Every single time I see an image of someone with something that costs dollar, I try not to assume how much that cost them in every sense. I didn't even eat most nights. I came up with like... <laughs> the irony is that the more wealth you accumulate in the public eye, the more brands want to give you free stuff. But did you know that a lot of that is classed as taxable income? Now I have bartered successfully before with a block of cheese, but try paying taxes with a freebie. Mr. Beast has talked about something similar because he discovered that a lot of game show contestants go home without their prizes because they can't afford the taxes. And he didn't want to host giveaways with a hidden price tag. There's also all kinds of tax implications with gifts from employers, depending on how the stuff is gifted. So keep that in mind under the following of Holly and his family sharing some of Sony's expenses over the years. Marvel and Sony were great. They gave me this super cool house to live in, right? We had like a pool and a cinema room and, and like a, a huge living room with a giant TV and stuff. So after shooting, all the cast just came to my house and we'd like chill in the pool. We had a diving board and we did a, uh, those like trick shot videos, which I actually put up online and put a picture up of my house. Well, it's not really my house, the place I was staying. And then the press were like, oh, we know where Tom Holland lives. And it was like my first week in Atlanta and Marvel were like, what are you doing, dude? What are you doing? We literally have just bought this amazing house for you and you're ruining it. So I had to take it down and... But we had a great time, we had a great time messing around, watching movies, seeing other movie night. John gave us a list of, I think it was 10 movies that we were supposed to watch, we only watched two, but we ended up came to my house, we just watched movies, and we just swam in and just messing around, it was, it was good fun. It's kind of like a, a frat house at one point, you know, it was kind of nuts. But uh, we were very professional. Went to bed early on a work night. We went to Atlanta with Harry. Harry, remember, was in first class. Was he? And, um, was he? Yeah, because he was flying with uh, under Tom's name. Oh, Tom's name. So he's saying that, and we need to rest out of your pocket. I'm always curious as what the brother does he work for you? Well, I really work for him, if I'm honest. <laughs> we just set, well, we're, we just set up, we're trying to set up a company, a production company together, and we've been writing a script together. Okay. And I work for him. I see. Yes. He works with you, is that fair to say? No, I work for you him. You work for if him? I did, if Harry wasn't in my life, I wouldn't have made it here tonight. Why do you say that? He's, well, no, because I'm just stupid, and he has to tell me where to go all the time. <laughs> did you interview him? Well, for actually, this? my brother Sam, this is funny, my brother Sam, um, is training to be a chef right now. Oh, he is? And on Spider Man 2, um, the studio were like, Would you like a chef? I was like, Yeah, but I'll, I'll find my own one. <laughs> <laughs> and I got them to hire Sam, and he just basically lived at my house and cooked for us every day. It was amazing. I met your uh, brother backstage. Yes. You were saying uh, your other brothers uh, are coming out to you. You obviously are very close to your family. Yes. Safe to say. Are they uh, with this very quick sort of onslaught of how recognizable you are? Are they helping keep you in check? They are. They're also loving it. My yeah. brother Harry has been on tour with us now for the, for the promotion of the movie, and he's had the time of his life. Yeah. You know, I'm there like working for hours on end, and he's just out exploring. <laughs> like big room service bills. Oh, yeah. Yeah.
The room service bill on my room is it's always charged to my room. <laughs> right. The first question he asks when we get to a hotel is like, what's your room, bro? What's your room? Just <laughs> like a charge it to your room. Like, Thanks, Harry. I tell one to all other things. Ah uh, yes. My evil twin Bersie the third, who contributes nothing to the bills, but loves collecting, is back on my shoulder encouraging me to spend. One reason we overspend is because we're not immune to stories of other people living a so-called luxe life. If you're like me and you like to touch the burning flagpole to check that it's on fire, then we can't resist the curiosity of trying to spend beyond our budget to see if that would make us feel like less of a sour wolf. Don't be such a sour wolf. I mentioned we need to enjoy the process more to kill the expectation of overnight rewards. We want more than we have because we often don't enjoy the journey because we attach more meaning to the outcome because outcomes often have a financial incentive and life costs money i agree with campaigner and journalist martin lewis that money doesn't automatically make you happy but financial hardship can be miserable it's confirmed for us that more money will remove all barriers in life when we hear things like you could have a free car perhaps if you pay the tax on it if you were holly or your employer would pay for so many things if only you were a movie star. But the thing is never the thing. I made a video slash podcast episode called Why I Don't Call Myself a Fan of Harry Styles. In the end, Harry Styles is not the thing. I won't go over that again right now. Two misconceptions we have are that no barriers are good and that the things you would buy with unlimited money are what would make you happy. But barriers make you more creative. I started my podcast and YouTube channels with next to no investment. That wasn't an upper limit problem. I can talk about upper limit problems more if you're interested. That creative challenge instead has a long list of benefits and things I wouldn't have learned if I just thrown money at the problem on day one. Now I know how I want to invest in those and it's all about options. It's not the party house or room service or a personal chef. Personal chef? Kind of like a personal chef, only better or a personal chef that makes anyone happy, but the freedom to accept or decline those things. If you're still on the way to financial freedom, can you create boundaries and give yourself more options daily to feel like you're in control? So it could be how you use your time. It could be an emotional choice. The more autonomy you exercise on a small scale, it's funny how the list of things you need shrinks. If you're nothing without this suit, then you shouldn't have it. As Peter Parker would say, I don't wanna go, so I'm not going to. Don't squirrel on me yet. The first last thing is we can reunite in the next installment if you join the mailing list for updates on new videos and podcasts from Save Like A Bear because places like YouTube want to control your consumption for you which means they don't always show you more from a creator even though you clicked like and stayed this far because they're more interested in pushing you the latest viral thing. The second last thing is that there is sometimes a third and fourth thing to wrap this all up, so hang tight. But today relates to a previous instalment called Why Do Movies Cost So Much To Make? At the moment, I tend to change the titles to stuff all the time. But in that, I also covered some of the perks if you work for Sony and how you might recreate those if needed at all, even if you don't work for Sony. So definitely catch up on that. Or coming up, I'm likely to keep talking about how to avoid comparison syndrome. So don't be a stranger and vote for that if we're on the same page. What are you expected to, as a big movie star now to get your two younger brothers for their 21st twin birthday? I bought my brother Sam a piano uh -huh. because he loves playing the piano. Great. And I bought my brother Harry a Rolex. Oh. But with my parents though, we went half and half. You it was did. like a real family endeavor. And uh, his 21st is a big birthday, you know? Yeah, and they'll keep those for the rest of their lives and, and uh, they'll be very memorable and, uh, and it's a big day for them. Being able to buy your family almost anything is one edge of the sword. Feel free to go back to what Holly said at the start about living in a bubble when he first became world famous. But here's the other edge of the sword. This business has a way of sort of taking over your life and, and it takes the steering wheel away from you. And for me, what I've realised is I want to remain the same person and, and still be that young kid who's from London who, who loves to play golf and loves to meet up with his mates. For a while I was kind of heading in that direction. I was like, maybe I'll move to LA and I'm going to try and be the biggest movie star in the world. And now I've completely changed tune and it's about, I want to make films that I'm really passionate about and I want to work with people that I really look up to and admire. I want to learn from people. And I've sort of lost the aspirations of being a famous person and sort of gained these new goals of just being a creative person who likes to work with people. And, and I think for me, it, it's been a massive turning point because it's meant that I can enjoy my work in the present, figuring out that has meant that the future of my life looks much brighter. Regardless of how much money you make or how many followers you have on Instagram, I look, my future me that I can see now looks way happier than he did two years ago. Why do we discount the cons of fame and wealth? Because we're simultaneously encouraged to succeed 
whatever that means. So we say, well, I'd just hire a bodyguard and forget about my privacy. Does anyone need to be in that position though? Or what if you're scared to try anything in case someone notices you? When I'm unsure if my processes are ambitious enough, I replay this Amy Porterfield episode. One of the principles that really hit home for me was this idea that people fear becoming big. And you have a name for it, you call it megaphobia. The challenge that happens is when people first start to experience some success, they'll start creating excuses about how big is a very bad thing for their life. And a lot of the times because they have no good role models on how to live a balanced life in that big arena. So first and foremost, if you don't have kids, talk to yourself like you were your own parent. Like you would never tell your child, you know, I just want you to have an average life where you don't have to worry about failure. Nobody has that speech with their kids. Right. We want them to dream big and we have to kind of take that advice ourselves. We set bigger goals and we fail a lot, but because we fail and we're aiming so high, we're going so much farther and faster than we would otherwise. Jay Papasan wrote The One Thing, which I highly recommend. If you want to have an impact on someone's life and leave a legacy, I'd look towards business rather than the performing arts unless that's genuinely where your talents lie. But also, if you do want to entertain like Holly, consider two things. Joe Russo told British GQ, it's a very disruptive time we're in. Brands are becoming a driver. Stars are becoming arguably less important. I think narrative and media are going to be disrupted over the next 10 years like cars and energy have been. But there's a universe where Tom Holland is the last great movie star coming in underneath the wire of disruption. People said a similar thing around the time of Magic Mike about Channing Tatum and his peers not being true successes to stars of the 90s like Tom Cruise because the paydays had de decreased. Performers need to be entrepreneurs anyway. At first it's out of financial necessity. But lots of out of work actors pay their bills by freelancing. Even Holly trained in carpentry for a while. The generation of movie stars that got their big break after Julia Roberts and co diversified their income and are incredibly wealthy as a result. Anyone can become an investor for example. But also the industry moved towards a model of paying less up front and the profit sharing on the back end can be far more lucrative anyway. What difference does that make if Holly is the last movie star in the making? The playing field has been leveled, even more so now that you're just as likely to tune into a randomer on Twitch as you are to Graham Norton or Jimmy Kimmel live streaming from a back room in their house if that's all that's possible on the day. Anyone anywhere can build an audience today with an internet connection and monetize that in diverse ways. And if you can't get the payday you want up front, there'll always be a way to earn on the back end. But we're also moving towards a creative culture where it's possible to help others with your output without sacrificing your privacy. I recommend Andre Tabea's video on this, The Rise of Faceless Creators. Sorry if I just mangled his name. One of the many reasons it took me six years to launch my blog was because of personal safety concerns and then I launched my blog, a podcast and two YouTube channels in one year when I realised I could both share my research and experiments to help others and control how I show up. Never let a lack of money or fear of success or failure get in your way. You always have options. It might not be your preferred choice right now but just make whatever choices you can because the very act of choosing how to feel in this moment, how to spend your time here with me today, how to treat others will free you far more than fame and wealth ever could. Strongest version of yourself is yourself. The almost final last thing is that there's always another segment after this. If anything from today felt like it might help get your finances down to a T, then please consider sharing this with a significant otter who might also get their finances down to a T as a result because our financial futures are important. Or speak up if you can't seem to get your finances down to a T so that I can get your question answered even if I can't answer it myself. It's time for another edition of What Is This Tom f I can swear, can I? Where King Holly is going to demonstrate again that we're capable of more than we think. Or possibly not. Oh no. You'll just have to fail better next time, Holly. Don't be afraid to make mistakes if your finger accidentally slips and hits the like button. It happens to me all the time. Go forth! Don't you have an elsewhere to be?